Hello, my name is Mickey Harris. I'd like to welcome you to Basic Airbrush Techniques. This is the first in a series of videos produced by the American Airbrush Association. In this video, we'll be going over the basic fundamentals. This is pretty much designed for the beginners. What we'll be doing is showing you the airbrushes that we're using, uh, how they function, and going over a series of exercises which we'll be practicing that'll help teach you to gain control of the double action airbrush. We'll also be working with some stencil techniques which can be applied to textiles as well as to illustration. We hope that you'll find this video fun and informative. So why me? Well, I have 17 years of airbrushing experience. I also have about 12 years experience teaching airbrush. You may have seen me in prior videos that I've done, or possibly in your local post office. But seriously, folks, I'm all business when it comes to airbrushing. I just take a lighthearted approach because I feel if you can't have fun taking care of business, then it begins to feel like work. Now let's take a look at the airbrush. Before we get into how the airbrush works, I'd like to explain to you a little bit about the equipment we'll be using. First of all, we'll be using the Badger Crescendo. This is a new gun on the market and very comparable to the Pache VL3. And of course, we have the VL3, which is a standard workhorse in the airbrush industry. We also have the new kit on the block, and this is the Theron Chandler Vega 2000. This is also a very good gun. Also, we'll be using, as far as the paints go, we're going to be using Createx. Createx is a new product out, and if you haven't heard about it, I'm sure that you will. And as far as the easel goes, this is a new easel, which I'm pretty proud of because I helped work on the design. This is made by Best Molding. Now let's go on to the diagram. Here we have the trigger. Behind it, here in the pink, is the rocker arm assembly. This green area here is a tube shank. That houses a spring, which gives tension to the rocker arm assembly. Back here is a lockdown nut, which locks the rocker arm assembly and the needle together. If you pull back on the trigger, that pulls the whole needle and rocker arm assembly back, which pulls that needle tip back in the cone. Now what that does is allows the paint to flow. And how that happens is your air pressure comes up through here and through some tubes in the housing and flows around the outside of the cone. This causes a vacuum. That vacuum pulls the paint up into the gun and through the cone and around the needle. And as you come back with the needle, more paint's allowed to go out. And as you go forward, it takes it down and stops it. And that's the basic working mechanics of a double action airbrush. Okay, now we get to the exercises. You've all seen airbrushers working on the street, and of course it looks so easy, but that's not the case. You have to know these exercises and gain that gun control in order to be able to do what appears to be easy. What we're going to start out with is the first basic step. And that's called making a dot. It's a very simple process. You push down on the button, gives you your air. You pull back on the button, gives you your paint. You push back forward on the button, and that stops your paint. When you're doing this exercise, I want you to do it with the air on constantly. What this does is doesn't confuse you with that secondary step. You just put the air on and go. Then all you'll have to do is concentrate on pulling back on the button and pushing forward on the button. This is what we want to concentrate on because that's where the control really lies. So we'll get up to our objects. We'll start the air, pull back on the button, push forward on the button, move over and do this again and again. Now as you begin to get the feel of this, you'll be able to speed up your motion and what this is teaching you to do is get the feel of that. This is an unnatural motion for the human finger. So it's something you have to get used to. How you hold the gun is another thing. Some people get up on it a little more, some down. That's something you have to 
what works for you, what's comfortable for you is what you want to do. You can't always imitate what you see from somebody else. It has to be comfortable. Some people have big hands, some are small, so that's important. This exercise is extremely important. It can be boring, but you've got to do it. And I want you to just continue to do this by the thousands. Now, when you've mastered that little trick, you want to do a flare line. All the flare line is, is the dot in motion. So keep your air on, push down, pull back and forward on the button again, but move the gun as you do it and you've got a flare line. Move the dot. When you push forward on the button, that allows that paint flow to taper off. Most people have a tendency to move along and pop off their finger. That's what we don't want you to do. That's not teaching you gun control. You're using the gun as a crutch, the air as a crutch. You're not mastering the control of the paint. And that's where true airbrush control comes in. So, we want to work that do those lines, cutting off the paint, keeping your airflow, and you can just speed those up if you want to. Get the feel of this. You are not creating any beautiful works of art, but what we are doing is teaching ourselves how to control that button. Because when you get to where you want to be able to create something, you want to be able to think about what it is you're painting and not how you're painting it. You want that to become a natural thing. Now, another exercise that we can do, I call it a continual line. And we try to do this where your line stays at the right consistency. So you just go ahead and get your paint flowing and move around. Now, the secret here is keeping your gun head at the same distance away from the surface you're painting. If you back away, our line changes. You get too close and too much paint, and it can spider web on you. So you want to be able to learn to get a little bit of freedom of motion and able to move around, keeping your gun tip at a consistent distance to and from it. There's not very many exercises that you really need to know in doing this, but what there is is you have to master each and every one of them. Now, there's a lot of different ways of doing these exercises that are basically teaching you the same thing, but it's a very simple thing. It's the ability to control the on and the off of the paint. Okay, another nice little exercise that helps you, we call a ladder. We put a couple vertical lines, keeping your air on again. You start and stop. I'm stopping that paint, the air's still running. What this exercise does is teach you how to start and stop in a controlled area. And you keep doing that over and over and over until you're very proficient at it and can work those lines. Now with the flare lines, they vary in width. And that's all controlled by that same motion of back and forth. It's just a matter of how long you keep it there, back and, and forth. Also, another thing that controls that line is the speed at which you move it. The faster you move it, it stretches the line more. You'll see the guys down uh, on the beaches and stuff painting uh, the palm trees and the sea oats, and they're using that stroke right there and throwing it out. That's just the flare line. We also want to learn to, as we've done here, you see a little bit of shading. We want to learn to control the ability to shade things. Now, this stroke we use here, the flare stroke, which was the same stroke as the dot, only in motion. Now we're beginning to see the effects of what motion does to that very simple stroke back and forth. Now we learn to see that that same stroke, back and forth very quickly on the button, can be controlled differently from our distance we are from it. This stroke here is the same as this stroke here. I'm just back. When you use this type of shading stroke, most people that I've seen, and most people that I teach, will start out, they'll want to shade an area by moving the gun along and hesitating. Every time you hesitate, you get a buildup of paint. You get those nasty little things there. Those are no-nos. You want a stroke, just as if it was an oil painting or something, a single brush stroke. If you think in those terms, it's very easy, because you know how to do your stroke back and forth. 
So if we want to shade in an area, we can apply those by strokes. We can increase the density of that just by applying more strokes over it. This won't allow us to have any of these stop points. So what you can do is make simple geometric shapes, like a circle. And you can come in and put soft strokes one at a time to fill that in. Now you can do that with those type of strokes and make a very even, consistent fill in on that as opposed to moving back and forth with the paint continually flowing. You can also come back in and layer those strokes heavier in one area allowing you to begin to give a little bit of dimension to the object you're painting. Also, when you do it in soft strokes like that, it allows you to cover up a little bit for mistakes. You can apply and build that up softly, and that will give you a little bit of control on what it is you're trying to do. What? That's it? Not a million more exercises? Afraid not. It's not that much to it. But what there is to that is that you do those over and over and over again until you get them right. You do them till you master them or they have to pry your bloody stump off the trigger. That's the way you do it. It's not that complicated. It's back and forth. But your ability to control that makes all the difference in the world. So what we're going to do here now is we're going to demonstrate that a little bit in a simple beach scene which will show you those, the usage of all those different little strokes and things that we've learned. Okay, I'm going to start out with the black. I'm going to do a elongated flare line, which is going to make a line for the sand dune. And it's just going to be the continuous line and the flare line kind of combined. So we'll just make us a line. We'll drag it out and let that thing flare right out there and disappear like that. Okay, we'll throw some sea oats in here. Some of that grass, happy little grass. And if you want to, you can throw up a palm tree shape in there. The palm tree lives here. Now what am I doing here? I'm blasting out those little flare strokes those things that we've mastered and loved so well. And you can back up a little bit. You want to give a little shape into that sand dune. That's that same elongated flare stroke, I'm just back and not putting out too much paint. Okay, let me switch colors here. We'll add a little color into this. I've also switched gun types. What I'm going to do here is begin to give myself a shape of the wave. Here we go again. This is our continuous line. Now, if you notice, I'm backing away from it. I'm letting that thing fuzz out on me. I'm going to do a soft shading in here. Strokes. It's the same on and off. I'm just, it's how I'm moving my gun and where I'm manipulating it. Here we go with a series of them back and forth. The flare line. There that rascal is again. Flare lines. Come in and shape. I'm letting those fade out and flare out. You notice that the the air pretty much continually running. What I'm doing is manipulating the paint. I'm coming in now and applying a little of that soft shading technique, which is just the same stroke. I'm only back a little further. Now, I can do the same here. Give me a little bit of a dimensional shape there around the sky area. Same thing with working the clouds. Now I can move my gun in closer. Tighten that line up a little bit. Back away, let them fade. Just those strokes. Hear that air running? All the time. 
The gun control is in that ability to manipulate the paint. All right, I'm gonna switch to yet a third gun. Here I'm gonna apply a little bit of a turquoise color, just to change the shape in that way a little bit. The tones. Now I can go to a hot pink here, which I'm gonna use in the sky. This is just our shading techniques being used. Soft strokes, back from a distance. I can come in and tighten a few if I want, get a little closer. But you can see that paint bursting out there one stroke at a time. It's being thrown out on there. Switching to my yellow here. Soft application in there. A little haze distance. I'm going to come back inside there with just a little more of that turquoise. The reason I'm doing that is I want to be able to give a little contrast when I come back with the white. So that stands out a little bit better. Now I can come in along the cloud edges if I want to and highlight them a little bit. And the sun might be striking them. The sun lives there. Happy little sun. Okay. I'm come along the top of this wave. Now I've got pretty much a continuous line thing going here, and I'm I'm jiggling it around just to break up the shaping of it some. And I can take it and actually let those little lines flare off. So it's that same stroke. Now here what I'm doing might be a little different is I'm backing my gun away so it fades away faster as I make that stroke. But it's the same stroke, it's just on and off with the button. And your manipulation of that is in your distance, the angle you've got your gun at. But if you start with the basics, and that is learning that stroke, that ability to turn that paint on and off when you need it and where you need it, then all those other little manipulations, something to kind of come into play. You can uh, discover those things on your own. But if you don't get the feel of the stroke, none of it will help you. It's the most important thing, and yet it's, it's a simple thing. It's just back and forth on the button. And you can come down and put a little highlighting down in the water where the sun's reflecting if you want to. And there you have it. That's a very basic and simple design that people make thousands and thousands of dollars on all over the country. That quick, that simple, using those very basic things that you just learned. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to learn about stencils, friskets, and masks. What we've learned so far has pretty much been a freehand technique. Now, as you know, the airbrush has a soft touch to it. But sometimes in illustrations and that type of thing, you need a hard, crisp edge. What we're going to be doing now is we're going to be demonstrating some of those basic techniques. We're going to be doing a very generalized and very simple stuff. As you can see here, this is a piece that took a lot of hours of work. We don't have time to demonstrate that because we don't have the tape. All right, now we're going to do a little frisket cutting. What I've done here is I've drawn out a little picture of the eye with pencil. I put a piece of frisket over it. Now when you cut frisket, once you start your cut, you want to keep the motion continuous because any hesitation can cause a flaw in it that'll show up when you're painting it. And of course, you must be sure to take care with what you're doing so that the edges are smooth 
and also that you don't hurt yourself. We're back now. I uh, hope you enjoyed that little parlor trick of mine. I didn't really cut myself. It was just something to emphasize that the dangers of an X-Acto knife. I hope you got something out of that. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and finish up with what we've got. What I'm going to do here is I've cut, as you know, I've cut my uh, frisket now, so I'm going to show you how to simplify this. What we want to do, and in this case, I'm going to go ahead and peel the outer edge away from it. I'm going to save that piece, so I'm going to put it right over there. And I'm going to take my brown, and this will allow me to come in and softly shade around that eye. Alright, now what I'm going to do is pull out the piece right in the center of the eye. Okay. Take my black here and apply that. Okay. Then we'll go that piece where we'll remove it and here you can be a little creative if you want depending on how you want to make the eye I might just give a little bit of a some illusions of color through there I can remove. Well, before I do that, let me put a little bit of pink in here just to tone that skin a little bit. Now we go in and I can remove this last piece or the white of the eye. And you can see the effects we're getting there. Now, of course, this is speeded up and very simplified, but what we're doing is we're giving ourselves a very clean edge. Now I can come back and I can softly shade the whites of the eye, some parts in there. Now, if this were a serious illustration of course it would be a lot more complicated process than this but once again time is a factor here so these simple methods for a beginner are best for you to start out with then I can add a little white in the eye I can even come back and tone a little bit more into the shape you could come and work your skin a little bit more around highlighting it then I can come back with my black. And here, I could use that little freehand flare stroke that we use. And we can make eyelashes. And 
this is a very simple and of course very quick effect but you can see the effect the soft touch as well as the hard edge in combination together and that's a very simple stencil technique but yet very effective okay now I'm going to show you a stencil technique this is a pretty interesting technique we we use it a lot in the shirt industry it's a little bit of a takeoff on the uh, frisket style but what we're using is a piece of acetate as opposed to frisket paper and we can put spray adhesive on it and adhere it to the shirt now I've cut this out with a stencil burner already and you can't do that of course on the shirt or you're in big trouble but what I'm gonna do is demonstrate how to do this I'm gonna peel away the inside piece and we'll set that aside and once again this helps by giving you a nice clean edge and you can use your free handing in between it and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be able to freehand a little bit on this dragon and get a lot of that soft touch within the confines of the stenciled edge Remember those little strokes we were learning? All these are those same strokes. Now I've shaped that a little bit. I'm going to come back in with a little green now. And I'm going to tone... Tone that real lightly. Next, what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring that piece back up. And I'm going to place that back in. Now I can take my white. I can spray in there the teeth are, the horns, I can remove that piece again, that's giving me a little bit of shaping in there, now I can come back again with my black, I can detail that a little bit, Remember to use those little strokes. Now I'm going to show you something that's a pretty neat little trick too. Stencils and can be made out of just about anything. Here I'm going to be using a piece of lace. Now it's an interesting effect you can get with this. Here we can make shapes of the scales without having to individually draw those scales in. And you can move this around and develop your pattern as you see fit. It adds a little texture to it, and it's a pretty simple process. I'm going to go back in there with that again. some little patterns now this is really a fine mesh here so you're probably not going to be able to see an awful lot of it in this
these are very simple techniques. And yet you can produce a nice sharp hard edge with it. Now you can come back in on this and highlight it if you want to. Bring in your white. And work those areas up to any degree of detail that you want to. Put a little highlight on it if you want to make it a little shinier skin. Or whatever you'd like to do. But this is a simple technique. And you can apply this technique to a t-shirt and it gives you a nice clean sharp edge. Well, I've enjoyed doing this tape, and I hope you've learned something from it. I want you to look forward to our upcoming videos from the American Airbrush Association. We'll be going into troubleshooting, maintenance, as well as some advanced frisket techniques. Thank you very much.